In this lecture, we are going to look at asymptotics notation, asymptotics for exponential functions and beyond. Okay, so we are going to start with that. So one thing I've already told you is if you had a function like 1 point square 5 n squared, 2.2 n log n, uh, let's say plus 3 n, something like this, then I said you can boil this down for the purposes of asymptotics uh, into n squared, for the purposes of asymptotics, remember that. Okay, so this is theta n squared, big theta n squared, and you can work from here, all right? Now, the problem though is what happens when you have 2 to the power n and 2 to the power, let's say, 2n. Let's call this f, let's call this g. And let's say to make life worse, there's a 1.2 times 2 to the n, and let's say there's a 2.4 times 2 to the n. Okay, so there's two constants here. The first constant is the 1.2 that sticks in front of 2 to the n. So there is this constant here, and then there's a constant on the exponent. So there's a 1 here and there's a 2 here. So there is another constant here. Now the question is, which constant can we get rid of for our asymptotic analysis? Obviously, the constant in front of f and g can be gotten rid of. That part is easy. But be careful about the constant on the exponent. So the constant on the exponent, you should not get rid of it. Why is that? If you got rid of it, then you could falsely conclude that f equals theta of g by getting rid of both the constants on the exponents, okay, and the constants in front of the numbers, which would be completely wrong. It should be completely wrong because let's call f, uh, and let's, see, let's cancel the constants, is 2 to the power n. Let's call g to be 2 to the power 2n. In fact, g equals f squared. Remember, 2 to the power 2n is 2 to the power n, the whole squared. All right, so this constant here on the exponent has the effect of squaring the function, not doubling the function. So this has the effect of squaring the function because it's a 2. It's taking the function to some power. Here, this has the effect of doubling the function or something like that, 2.4 times in the function, whatever the English name for that is. All right. So roughly doubling the function, this is roughly squaring the function. So in asymptotic notation, you cannot write f equals theta g. That would be totally wrong. So ignoring the constants in front of the exponent is wrong. In fact, you can say f equals O of g. You can say g equals omega of f. But f is most definitely not theta of g, or g is most definitely not theta of f. This has to be remembered, all right? Constants in front of these exponents cannot be compared. So for example, let's take 2 to the power n and 3 to the power n. Let's call this f, let's call this g. Are they the same up to a constant? And the answer is they are not. In fact, 3 to the power n is 2 to the power log 2 to the base 3 n, okay? And this is something like 1.57 blah, 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 all right? This is a number. So therefore, this is 2 to the power n, and this is roughly 2 to the power, let's say, 1.57 n. Even though the exact constant is not clear to me, this is g, all right? So in fact, you can say f equals big O of g. You can say g equals big omega of f. But you cannot say that they are big theta. This 2 and this 3 are the base of the exponents, they cannot be equated. But if you had a 1.2 times this, if you had a 7.9 times this, the constant that's multiplicative in front can always be taken away. Okay, so that is super important to note, which is when you're dealing with functions, exponentials, be careful about the constants because they are not the same type of constants as the constants that you multiply in front of functions. All right. The other important part that goes with exponentials is the logarithm. Okay, so whenever I say c equals log to the base a of b, what am I saying? Then I'm saying that a to the power c equals b. Okay, a to the power c equals b. All right, these are the same things. Example, 15 equals, uh, not 15, let me do 16, 
log 2 to the base 2 of 16 equals 4. So here a is 2, b is 16, c is 4, so 2 to the power 4 equals 16. Okay, so logarithm is the inverse operation of exponentials and therefore you can, you should show that any two bases are related. So log a to the base b equals log, let us take another number d to the base b divided by log d to the base, sorry, log a to the base b is log of b to the base d divided by log of a d to the base a. So log b by log a. So log b divided by log a is log d. Another way of looking at it is like this. Another way of looking at it is log of a to the base b times log of c to the base b. So here b is the base, here is less than you know, log a to the base c. Okay. So log operates very much with these equalities. So these equalities are very important. So let me take two examples. How does this affect asymptotic notation? So let me take a couple of examples on how this affects asymptotic notation. All right. So let me take f equals log 2 to the base n. Let us take g equals log 5, okay. So this is log to the base 5 of n, here is log to the base 2 of n. How are f and g related? How are f and g related? So turns out, turns out you can always write g which is log 5 to the base n. You can use this equality to say which is the same as log 5 to the base 2 times log to the base 2 of n. So this is f and this is a constant. So if when I take f as log to the base 2 of n and g as log 5 to the base n, they are just a constant times each other. So multiplying one by a constant gives the other. So therefore, in this case, f equals big theta of g, they are asymptotically equal. Any two functions that involve logarithms to two different positive bases are up to a constant the same, all right, in other words. So these are kind of very, very important uh, equalities and hopefully you have taken them in calculus. So you should have seen some of these in calculus. But now is a good time to review this, okay. So chapter 3 of this book has a review. We are going to post a review assignment. So hopefully you follow the review assignment and uh, you understand when I say 2 to the power n and 2 to the power 2n, which is the bigger function. So you should not cancel the 2 in front of the exponent because something raised to the power of an exponent has the effect of squaring or taking the function to the power, something uh, written a constant multiplied in front of a function has the effect of doubling. This has to be remembered. The other thing that has to be remembered is properties of logarithms which are going to be very, very important. All right. I will see you in the next lecture where we will summarize this notion of complexity classes. Okay. We will find classes of complexities of different algorithms and why they are important. All right. So, so far we have looked at uh, some asymptotic notation. Let us connect it back to algorithms. All right. So let us look at some of the worst case complexities of some known algorithms, all right. So we already did binary search as part of discrete math. So there was a lecture where we covered binary search as part of 28-24. And it turns out if I give you an array of size n, the running time complexity of binary search is theta log n, all right. Um, and so you can say that binary search is a theta log n algorithm. Okay, and um, we also looked at insertion sort. Okay, the worst case complexity of insertion sort is theta n squared. All right, uh, we looked at merge sort so far, uh, even though we haven't quite done this analysis in a very rigorous way. 
we uh, indicated last time that the worst case complexity was n log n. So in terms of uh, complexity, where do these things look like? So log n is going to be a very uh, you know small complexity compared to let's say n log n, which is going to be the complexity of merge sort. Okay, so log n is big O and log n, which is big O n squared. So insertion sort is asymptotically a strictly slower algorithm than merge sort. Okay, it's a uh, running time is going to be faster. Okay, now are there algorithms beyond this, right? So for example, multiplying two matrices, uh, the complexity is going to be about n cube. All right, so big O n cube. So this is matrix multiplication. And there are algorithms uh, which have an n to the power 4 complexity. All right. Uh, for example, uh, all pair shortest path. Uh, no, that's uh, already n cube. I guess that's n matrix multiplications. That's n4 or it's n cube log n. We'll study this. Okay. So there is an algorithm with n4. Interestingly enough, uh, these algorithms are considered efficient or polynomial time algorithms. Even though n log n is not a polynomial, it's upper bounded by a polynomial here n cube, n squared, n cube. So these kinds of algorithms are called polynomial time algorithms. All right. And beyond this, there are exponential time algorithms, algorithms whose running times go like 2 to the n, 3 to the power n, n factorial, and so on. So these are going to be exponential time algorithms. Okay, so polynomial, exponential. And what are these algorithms? These are algorithms for very hard problems like SAT, satisfiability problem, or the traveling salesperson problem I briefly mentioned in the very first lecture, or the graph coloring problem. Okay, so there is a very important class of problems where the worst case complexity of the algorithms are here. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in, towards the end of this class when we consider P versus NP. All right. And in fact, there are things in the middle. For example, something like 2 to the power log n squared or 2 to the power log n to the power 4. Okay, And these are called polylog time. Okay, And these are also important. Okay, So these are n to the power polylog, so n to the power polylog. So these are between polynomial and exponential. And examples are factoring algorithms. So many factoring algorithms uh, have a complexity which is in this in this class. Um, some uh, recent uh, algorithms for graph, graph isomorphism uh, for special classes of graphs also belong to this class. Okay, so so these are going to be classes of algorithms. They are going to be very efficient. What we consider efficient algorithms, and that's somewhat controversial. And these are polynomial time algorithms. So you start with some algorithms that take log n time, n log n, n squared, n cube, n4, and so on. In fact, we'll study some algorithm very next lecture, uh, which has a running time of 1.54, blah, blah, blah. And there are algorithms that take a running time of 2.7. So there are some very crazy complexities here, and we'll see how they arise next time. In fact, on this other side, there are algorithms that run in constant time, and we call them theta 1 algorithms. Theta 1 means it's constant time. Any constant is theta 1. Okay, so theta 1 is constant time. Okay, simple algorithms which do not depend on the size of the input. So, for example, given number n, is it divisible by 2? If n is given in binary, the divisibility by 2 is very simple. You just look at the last digit of n. If it's a 0, yes. If it's not a 0, no. That's an example of a constant time algorithm, algorithm that runs in theta 1 time. We saw binary search, log n. There are intermediate algorithms that run in log log n time. Okay, uh, n log n, we saw merge sort. Okay, And there are algorithms that run in n log n log log n time. All right. Uh, so algorithms can get pretty complicated. All right, And the running times can span a spectrum from constant time all the way to exponential time, n factorial. In fact, the longest running algorithm that I know of is an algorithm whose complexity is 2 to the power 2 to the power 2 to the power 2 n times. Okay, and these are called non-elementary algorithms. Okay, there are many non-elementary algorithms. Okay, um, and so um, 
and there are there is a class of non elementary algorithms as well okay so and these would be longer running times than any of these functions here it's bigger than n factorial for example which is bigger than 3 to the n which is bigger than 2 to the power n all right so if you keep going along the the scale of complexity algorithms can span anywhere from theta 1 like a very simple algorithm to algorithms which have a non elementary complexity why would people study them uh, well they do because they are interesting they solve interesting theoretical problems so we study them uh, there are polynomial time polylog time exponential time and so on all right so with this we will start to explore divide and conquer algorithms in the very next set of lectures see you then bye